Ladies and gentlemen, a decade ago, I was honored to deliver a lecture at the first international gathering of cardiac surgeons here in the ancient library of Alexandria, reborn on the shores of the Mediterranean. That topic was public health and private medicine, looking back and looking forwards. I'm happy to say that this lecture, known as the Ibrahimian Lecture, was very well received, not only by the surgeons who attended, but many who heard about it and who saw the text, and many asked to have it available. And hence, I have the privilege of reporting this text, which is the same text I delivered over a decade ago, now emerging from the studio of the Library of Alexandria. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a very distinct pleasure to welcome you here to the Library of Alexandria, reborn after an absence of 1600 years. The Biblioteca Alexandrina's ambition is to once more bring world-class learning, intellectual dialogue, and scientific discourse to the very spot where the ancient Library of Alexandria once stood. Yours is the first group of science we host in the new library, a few weeks before our official opening. So please forgive the incompleteness of some of the services as we race against time in the final countdown towards the official opening in 2002. The International Day of the Book was to be our preferred selection, but we did it a bit later. How appropriate that this gathering should be a meeting of physicians? Alexandrian medicine played an important part in the ancient world, bringing as it did two great traditions, the Greek and the Egyptian, into a spectacular fusion that was to advance medicine to a plateau where it would stay for over a thousand years. The ancient library of Alexandria started as the Museon, or the museum, a temple to the muses where the most eminent scientists, philosophers, and artists would meet and study and discuss. It was a gathering of brilliant minds devoted to rationality, dialogue, understanding, and openness to the other. On this very spot, Aristarchus was the first human being to say the earth revolves around the sun. Eratosthenes proved that the earth was spherical and calculated the circumference of the earth to the amazing accuracy of some few percentage points, while Hipparchus calculated the length of the solar year to within six minutes. Euclid wrote the elements of geometry. Maneto chronicled the pharaohs and gave the dynasties the names we use to this day. And Herophilus identified the brain as the key to control of the body. Now the great library disappeared over 1600 years ago, overwhelmed by a wave of zealotry that would not tolerate scientific inquiry or philosophical questioning or the opening to the other. And modern Egyptian medicine, which is so ably represented here tonight, is also the product of opening unto the other, the modern West. Muhammad Ali Pasha, established the Qasr al-Aini School of Medicine in 1827. Fifty years later, Sonbul tells us, Egyptian medicine had been transformed from a largely medieval practice to a modern one. It went on to become better and better, and some of Egypt's most eminent physicians are practicing at the most distinguished institutions in the world. Today, you bring the practice of medicine in Egypt to the cutting edge of world knowledge. Today, a great global revolution is looming in medicine. Today, the Bibliotheca Alexandrina is preparing to once more become the place to discuss the ethics of science and its application to be the window of the world on Egypt and Egypt's window onto the world. And today, I'm most privileged to deliver the Ibrahimian Lecture, named in honor of a great Egyptian pioneer, Dr. Muhammad Ibrahim, 
who is the person most responsible for the establishment of cardiac surgery in Egypt. I am delighted that his son, Professor Mohsen Ibrahim, is with us tonight. We are all in his debt as his example continues to inspire generations of practitioners. A visionary, he cultivated the healthy skepticism of true scientists and remained devoted to the noble vocation of healing. It was Dr. Muhammad Ibrahim and other pioneers of modern medicine in Egypt, such as Ali Pasha Ibrahim, who founded the new Qasr al-Aini teaching hospital in 1927 and transformed the medical faculties in Egyptian universities, and Dr. Naguib Mahfouz, who established a whole school of gynecology. These are the pioneers who established modern Egyptian medicine. So, to his and their memory, a profound salute. And I hope that he and they would have approved of what I'm about to say. Here are my themes for today. Throughout the long history of humanity, the art of healing the sick has been the most respected of vocations and the most appreciated of sciences. Yet the understanding of that long history is flawed, I believe, by the intertwining of two distinct aspects of the question that blur our understanding of many realities. These are public health and individual or private medicine. Only recently have those two common threads been disentangled, mostly in the last century, but possibly starting in the middle of the 19th century. It is of these two threads, public health and private medicine, that I want to speak today. First, I'll trace the development of medicine from its origin through its three modern revolutions and assert that despite the potential of the new scientific revolution in the biological sciences that is at our door, the medical profession is entering a period of deep self-examination and potential crises due to the perceived diversions of these two threads. Second, I will argue for a new view of medicine that can hopefully help weave the strands together in a strong and sturdy line, a new thread of Ariadne for our times, to help get the public and the practitioners on the same plane as the scientists all working for the common good of humanity. Third, and to conclude, I will attempt to sketch a vision of the future of medicine in this new century. A future that you will forge by dint of your example and the values that you will instill in your students. So let us start with a brief retrospective. In history, we sometimes refer to revolution, the industrial revolution, the informatics revolution. We tend to use these terms to mean major shifts in the sweep of history that have been marked by substantial changes in the condition of massive numbers of people around the planet. Rarely can one pinpoint a single date or event for this transformation. But the history of any topic, and medicine is no different, is not only subject to such sweeping revolution, but also punctuated by the high points of individual achievements that have marked the milestones of the road to these broad transformations. So shall it be in my talk today. Broad changes referred to as revolutions and a salute to the major events that punctuated history, the individual achievements that remain an inspiration to us all to this day. Now the first revolution in medicine has gone through a long period. And for me, there are a number of such revolutions, but I place the first medical revolution in the domain of antiquity, with the Egyptian Imhotep as its greatest protagonist. Imhotep, a genius by any measure, builder of the great step pyramid of Saqqara, was justly immortalized as the Egyptian god of medicine, and his renown as a physician was sustained over millennia, not just centuries. That first revolution was the adoption, at least by some, of the view 
that disease had a cause and could be cured and was not just something that had to be endured. Careful observation, experiment, and the seeds of the scientific method of empirical trial and error can be traced back to those dim days of early antiquity. These approaches lead to a variety of treatments, some effective and some totally dubious, if not downright harmful. But they implied a belief in the agency of treatment, including surgery, to effectively bring about a change for the better in the human condition. The second part of that first revolution came when the efforts were systematically codified into a corpus of knowledge and organized along inductive and deductive lines. The Greek physicians, disciples of Asclepius and of Hippocrates, made major contributions to this development and it was in ancient Alexandria that much of it would truly flourish. Alexandria was to witness a huge expansion in the contributions to medicine. Herophilus, who lived in the heady days of the flourishing library of Alexandria, was the first to bring to bear the rigorous anatomical study with major efforts at functional analysis. He not only correctly identified the brain as the key organ of intelligence, as opposed to Aristotle, who had argued for the heart, but he also named such features as a duodenum and many other relevant studies, including the early identification of blood circulation, the measurement of the systolic and diastolic rates of the pulse, and other such activities. And Herophilus and his colleague Erasistratus were to found the two most successful schools or houses of medicine in ancient Alexandria. And the last of the truly great physicians of the ancient world, Galen, studied at Alexandria before heading back to his native Pergamon and from there to Rome to treat inter alia the emperors Marcus Aurelius and his deranged son Commodus. Thus the first medical revolution was started millennia ago and gave us some insights, some names, some treatments, the Hippocratic Oath and little else. These products found their way to the 18th century largely unimproved. But the torch was passed from the Hellenistic physicians to the Muslim scholars like Al-Razi and Ibn Sina, Avicenna to the Europeans, and they were the great codifiers organizing all the known knowledge in encyclopedic works that defined medieval medicine for hundreds of years, well past the Renaissance. And yet, we cannot pass in silence over the enormously fascinating and largely unacknowledged in the West contribution of these great scientists, including, for example, Ibn al-Nafis, who died in 1288 and was undeniably the first to truly describe the circulation of the blood long before Harvey. And this was well advanced before the 16th century anatomical studies of Andrea Vesalius, or the 17th century work of William Harvey, modern discoverer or rediscoverer or exponent of the circulation of the blood in 1628. But Andrea Vesalius and Harvey represent a transition in the West insofar as they were believers in observation and experimentation, not the power of the views of the ancients. And now we carry into the modern era and where three revolutions of modern medicines in recent time are overlapping and continuing, reinforcing each other to bring better health care to people all over the world. Now, health care includes both preventative and curative aspects. Now, let me define the start of recent times with the late 18th century and the start of the 19th century, which not only coincides with the Industrial Revolution beginning to take hold, but also with the ideas of the Enlightenment, the American and French revolutions having their profound impact on Western and global history. More relevant to our topic today, that was also coincides with the start of an accelerating series of major contributions that gradually replace our ancient medieval worldview 
with something approximating the modern worldview. And the honor roll is splendid. To name but a few, in 1798, Edward Jenner starts vaccination against smallpox. 1840s sees the discovery of anesthesia for surgery. In the 1850s, Claude Bernard elucidates the endocrine functions. In 1859, Charles Darwin changes our view of nature and other species through the theory of evolution. In 1865, Lister invents surgical antisepsis using carbolic acid. In the 1880s, Pasteur launches bacteriology. In 1895, Rongton discovers X-rays. In the 1890s and early 20th century, Freud and Jung and others plumb the human psyche. Now, while these punctuating highlights were indeed steps that increased our knowledge of the human body and of the vectors of disease, the net result in terms of massive improvements in human well-being were being silently forged elsewhere. Three great revolutions were coming to healthcare. The first great medical healthcare revolution was not wrought by doctors at all. It was the work of engineers. In the 19th century and early 20th century, the systematic establishment of proper waterworks and sanitation in most major cities was probably the first major revolution in public health. And it did very significantly reduce the massive problems of waterborne diseases that still plague so much of the developing world, where as much as a third of humanity lacks adequate sanitation and about a sixth lack adequate access to safe drinking water, with concomitant infant mortality rates and low life expectancies. Now, the next two revolutions were indeed the results of medical research and medical practice. The second revolution came from anesthesia, which made surgical interventions much more bearable, while the use of Lister's antisepsis approach reduced infections. Surgery with us from the time of Imhotep came of age in the last 150 years or so. But the third revolution was the pharmacological revolution, which came about with the discovery of antibiotics and the much more effective use of chemical medicines. To this must be added the very widespread use of the vaccines that prevent many of the dreaded diseases of the past. Today, in the advanced industrial countries, vaccines, direct descendants of Jenner and his milkmaids, are so common that many scourges have become all but unknown. Not just smallpox, which has been eradicated worldwide, but polio, tuberculosis, measles, rubella, and many other childhood diseases that claim millions of infants worldwide have been largely prevented through systematic vaccination programs. And today, a new medical revolution is brewing. It is being formed in the womb of the rapidly developing revolution in the biological sciences. Today, the biological sciences are on the threshold of a revolution as profound and as exciting as that of physics in the glorious 40 years between 1905 and 1945, when all the concepts were changed from cosmology to atoms, from relativity to quantum mechanics. Nothing would be the same again. And today in biology, we are decoding the genomes. We are harnessing bacteria to do our work. And we are learning to tinker with the very building blocks of life. Now, where will this revolution take us? I can see that before the end of this century, medicine and hopefully public health will be totally transformed. The practice of surgery will be so changed, so transformed, and radically reduced, if not totally abolished, as we learn to turn genes on and off, and as mastery 
of an individual's pluripotent stem cells allow us to regrow for that individual new organs damaged beyond repair. In addition, new developments into the interface between humans and machines, popularized with cyborgs in Hollywood films, will become real and people will live longer and geriatric medicine will take on a special role as populations stabilize and even decline with the inevitable reduction of fertility flowing in the wake of female education and empowerment in all the countries of the world. By the end of this century, we will be looking back at our medicine today, at the turn of the century, as we look today to the practices in medieval medicine, backward, painful, and verging on the barbaric. But that is still a long way off. And medicine and the science that undergirds it still has a long way to go. And there will be many ethical issues that societies will have to face as we advance into that glorious future. So let us come back to the state of medicine and public health today at the beginning of the 21st century. Now medicine through its three revolutions I have just described has made giant strides in the last century. And yet, despite its great achievements, the medical profession itself is at a crossroads. To understand that, let us backtrack a bit and disentangle the two threads I mentioned at the outset the medical treatment of individuals and the public health aspects of the management of healthcare. Sub-themes exist in each of these two main threads. Medicine and public health have become intertwined in the public mind, yet they are very different things. And though mostly complementary, they can nevertheless sometimes work at cross purposes. The first, medicine, is largely focused on the health of the individual. The second, public health, is focused on the average health of the entire population measured statistically. Now, Kerr White identified the year 1916 as the decisive point at which, in the United States, that distinction became clear. The Rockefeller Foundation started funding the establishment of the first schools of public health independent of the schools of medicine. And Richard Horton attributes to this decision the abandonment of the social impulse within the American medical education. This division contributed to the origination of two distinct histories of Western medicine, histories that had until then been indivisible. Now, the divergence of the two histories, as Horton sees it, can be immediately grasped if we review what the Centers for Disease Control, for example, consider the 10 greatest milestones of public health. They are vaccination, motor vehicle safety, safer workplaces, control of infectious diseases, decline in death from coronary and heart disease and stroke, safer and healthier foods, healthier mothers and babies, fluoridation of drinking water, and recognition of tobacco as a health hazard. No medical procedures figure in that list. Increasingly, people view national policy, public education program, sound diets, better lifestyles, counseling, vaccination, environmental hygiene, as keys to preventative medicine and public health. Now this is in contrast to the deepening focus of individual treatments of severely sick persons, which remains at the heart of the individual medical practitioner's professional sense of pride. Now bringing these two strands together is at the core of the challenge of transformation of medicine for the new century. The fundamental shift from individual medicine to public health is the, is the shift from curative to preventative as well as the shift between the concerns with the health of individuals to the health of entire populations. 
The conflict arises when the allocation of funds is at stake. The role of research and of public support programs is an issue. How much new technique is required versus making what is already known more accessible to larger numbers of people? How much to develop new treatments versus how much to accelerate the transition of treatments from lab to patients and to scale up the application of known beneficial care to large numbers of individuals. Now the issues are being complicated by the evolving nature of the medical and public health enterprises. On the medical side, we note enormous specialization the fragmentation and complementary of different fields and the divergence between research and clinical work. And then there is the manner in which the enterprise is undertaken. Clinical trials increase. Mark Chassin observed that in 1966 there were 100 clinical trials, randomized controlled trials in peer-reviewed journals. In 1995, there were over 10,000. Yet these studies do not bridge the gap between the researchers and the practitioners who become increasingly identified as separate communities. And all of that within the medicine side. On the public health side, the issues are somewhat different. Concern with the public-private divide is growing more acute the role of private providers of treatment, big pharmaceutical companies, as well as HMOs or health management organizations, vies with the perception of profit versus need. It is noteworthy that the current profit margins of the US pharmaceutical companies is in the range of 18%. Now they have a substantial R&D component and commitment but they also spend up to 40% of their money on marketing and related administrative activities. Now, I'm not faulting private companies, I'm faulting public authorities that forget that public goods in economic terms must be funded by the public purse. Adam Smith, father of the invisible hand, said in The Wealth of Nations, that the state is responsible for erecting and maintaining those public institutions which though they may be of the highest degree advantageous to a great society are however of such a nature that the profit could never repay the expense to any individual or small number of individuals and which it therefore cannot be expected that any individual or small number of individuals should erect or maintain. That is the case for public intervention. That is the case with vaccination, environmental hygiene, and much of the preventative aspects of public health. So the shifting boundaries of the public and the private domains in the provision of health services remains an area of concern and one where many of the issues of the new century shall play out. Today's institutional arrangements are also part of the problem because they are perceived as competitive rather than complementary. And because we do not effectively weave into a common fabric the roles of the many who labor in the domain of health. And they are many. Eli Ginsberg observed that in 1927 there were two health providers, healthcare workers, for every physician in the United States. By 1999, there were 16. Now we do need teams to provide excellent care. Teams working in hospitals, in schools, in community centers, all working like musicians in an orchestra, playing different music and different instruments, but the whole producing a great symphony. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. To achieve this, we need two things, and they start with the medical doctors. First, to change the notion of solo practice. 
and second, to rethink the prevailing values of medical practice in the last 20 years or so. Kenneth Schein, president of the U.S. Institute of Medicine, in his farewell speech last October, called the medical profession a cottage industry. He said, we are the largest cottage industry in the world. We have huge cottages that have various types of technology in them, but they have poor communication both internally and externally. And there is much to support that view. Computer records are driven by specialized studies of cardiac care or children's cancer, but not systematically to cover the whole population of patients, much less the whole external population at large. Now, managing this huge data will require IT, which offers enormous potential for system-wide connectivity, potential that is still sorely underutilized in the medical profession. Setting up such system-wide approaches would be costly, but not as costly as many other areas where funds are being expended today. Are we paying for increasingly minor variation of an existing technology? Is there redundancy in the system? How much additionality is there in the variations from CAT scans, MRIs, etc.? Here it is pertinent to ask, are we paying for major advances or minor variations? Variations that do not actually advance the treatments much. Now, while recognizing that many technologies advance incrementally, we still need to question the emerging pattern of research and practice in a place like the United States, which spends infinitely more than many European countries and whose biomedical and research enterprise is justly envied across the planet, but still ranks very low on indicators of overall health of the population and of the dispersal of those indicators over the various subgroups of the population. So, as we enter the 21st century, the work of medicine has now broken down into its constituent parts. The researchers are increasingly separated from the clinicians among the doctors. The physicians now rely on armies of specialized health personnel and the biomedical enterprise churns on with all the constituent parts. Now, the public health enterprise is connected but separate from the medical enterprise. The focus on prevention does occasionally come together with treatments such as annual checkups, mammograms, child vaccinations. And on the horizon looms the promise of the great biological revolution. Now, what does the situation tell us about visions for tomorrow? So, allow me to get into really difficult territory, predictions. I predict that the transformation of medicine and public health in the 21st century shall indeed take the path of integrating the healthcare professions into a true system of healing and health. Let me sketch out the likely scenario of this development. The next 20 years or so are going to bring us face to face with a profound confrontation of the privatization of science and the patenting of knowledge. New ethical dilemmas shall be highlighted as we debate medicine as a commercial service and public health as a public good. The trigger of the dispute will be the price of medicine, especially in the less developed countries. We have already seen this in the case of AIDS and we will see it repeated in the case of other medicines linked directly to the new rounds of global trade talks following on WTO meetings. The next 20 years or so will also see a whole new approach to bioethics as the new technologies open up avenues that hitherto remained in the domain of science fiction and as public fears of scientists running wild will try to curb research. I predict that reason will prevail 
and scientific research will continue apace. The future is being framed by the new biology. The promise of the genome is only going to be realized over the next two to four decades. Proteomics and metabolomics will complement the genomics we have come to know. Genetics and epigenetics will come together. And establishing the proteome, the total protein complement of the human cell, will open up whole new vistas for medical research and application. Bioethics, already an important topic for researchers, will become much more so for practitioners of medicine and healthcare. Private medicine will have to face choices on the possibilities of tinkering with genes of a fetus to avoid lifelong disabilities or crippling inherited diseases. And if such choices would seem straightforward to many, there is the slippery slope of how far to go we go from life-saving interventions to interventions with the unborn child for aesthetic reasons. And the specter of designer babies appears on the horizon. After all, cosmetic surgery is very much with us today, but it is usually practiced on patients who are consenting adults. But while many of the issues on private medicine will be new, many will be extensions of the emerging debates on bioethics that the new biology has already triggered in Western societies. More difficult will be somewhat different issues that will be raised in the domain of bioethics for public health or population-wide bioethics. There are questions such as what should societies do about health inequalities? Should the goal be equality? Or should the goal be maximum improvement for the worst off? If the health of all groups is improving over time, is there a problem? Even if the gaps between the healthiest and the least healthy is growing? These and many other questions will have to be faced by doctors healthcare specialists and societies at large before too long. But let me get back to the practice of medicine. I think the 2020s shall see the transformation of the practice of medicine from the largely solo practice that exists today towards the establishment of truly integrated systems of healthcare. So instead of solo practice, we must think of systems of care. Instead of visit-based care, we must think of continuous healing relationship. Instead of professional autonomy driving variability, we must think of customized care according to patient needs. Instead of professionals controlling care, we must think of the patient as the source of control. Instead of information as a record, we must think of shared knowledge and information flowing freely. Now these are the hallmarks of the new 21st century integrated system of medicine and healthcare. A system where decision making will increasingly be evidence-based. Transparency shall replace secrecy and safety shall be a system property not just an individual responsibility to do no harm. A system where cooperation among clinicians shall be the norm and where waste is continuously decreased rather than seeking cost reduction by management of HMO fiats. By the middle of the century, the revolution will be almost complete. The new treatments will be in place and the practice of medicine will have experienced a profound transformation in those 50 years as was experienced in the years between the 1920s and the 1970s. But whereas the closing decades of the last century saw only incremental improvements, the second half of the 21st century will see dramatic new shifts in the very concept of treatment as the genetics revolution takes hold. From switching the genes on and off and the coding for particular proteins, the replenishment of particular constellations of cells, the regrowth of organs at will, and so much more, all of that will become possible and feasible. And the world of our grandchildren will be a truly different one from our own. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have come a long way in the last 30 minutes from ancient Alexandria through the Middle Ages to the pride of modern medicine. And we traced modern medicine through its three revolutions, public health, such as water and sanitation, anesthesia and surgery, and the pharmacological revolution and antibiotics. And we look into the pending fourth great revolution as we realize the promise of the new biology. We track the divergences and the coming together of public health and private medicine, rejecting the false dichotomy and recognizing that inescapable complementarity between the health of individual patients and the average health of entire populations. We peered into the future and what the 21st century could hold. And in all this, you have been patient travelers and explorers. For like all doctors, you are committed. Scientists, you are committed to the search for truth. Healers, you are committed to the betterment of the human condition. Together, we have searched and explored in our hearts for what is right, for us, for our children, and for the world. And like all explorers, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you.